All right, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody, it's great to have you here. Um, again, I want to, before we get started, thank the Global Institute for Water Security and also the Global Water Futures Project for underwriting this lecture series. And uh, also remind you of our speaker next week, Roy Brower, uh, speaking on water economics. Uh, Roy is the director of the uh, Water Institute at the University of Waterloo, so he'll be our speaker here next week. But today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Yin Fan Reinfelder. Uh, Ying is a professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, she obtained her PhD from Utah State University back in the early 1990s, was then a uh, postdoc at MIT and then Princeton working on some very important work on representative elementary areas that I know affected some of my early thinking about uh, watersheds. She took uh, an extended maternity leave. We heard about some of this today talking with the postdocs and it's been so interesting to see her career progression. A seven year mat leave, I guess you might say, and has come back with such a vengeance. It's, uh, it's so impressive uh, during this, this, uh, this time uh, with really doing the, the deep intellectual leadership on global groundwater. She's had several high profile papers in PNAS, science, uh, nature geoscience, nature climate change. That's really helped, I think, shape the field of global hydrology. Uh, she's very active in terms of service to the discipline. She's involved with the National Academy of Sciences Committee uh, uh, currently on, on future water resource needs for the nation. Uh, she's on the NASA Earth Systems, Earth Science Advisory Committee currently. Uh, she's been part of the board of directors of COASI. I think that ended uh, a few years ago. Uh, I really appreciated her service to AGU, uh, being on the Hydrological Sciences Awards Committee. Uh, she's involved with several journals. She's a co-editor of uh, HESS, Hydro Hydrology and Earth System Science, something the students are all working on now with their reviews that they're uploading soon, and has been an associate editor for Hydrological Processes. So it's really uh, a, a, a real pleasure to have Ying with us. She's going to tell us about some of her work on uh, the Earth's critical zone and groundwater generally. And uh, uh, I think what really differentiates Ying from most of the people in this area and that I so appreciate is just how clear thinking she is and her ability to pose simple questions that really strike at the heart of what we don't know. And I think this is really the hallmark of uh, leading science. And uh, Ying, we're looking forward to hearing your talk today. Thank you, Jeff, for that uh, very generous introduction. And it's my immense uh, pleasure and, uh, and honor. And I'm humbled to be here uh, with you today. And uh, I'm not very coherent because I did not sleep. So, uh, so pardon me, and if I uh, don't make sense, and email me if you have more questions. Okay, so the title is uh, Three Hydrologic Depths in the Earth's Critical Zone. Uh, basically, I'm asking those three questions. How deep is the water table? Everywhere you go in the world, where is the water table beneath your feet? How deep do plant roots go? And then how deep does the rain normally penetrate? And uh, I will um, the, explain why I'm asking those questions. But I also want to emphasize that uh, there is the global view that I want to take. And uh, for three prim uh, primary reasons. Uh, number one, these three questions are really motivated by global issues. Uh, number two, uh, I happen to be uh, visiting a global institute so I know uh, I'm safe here talking about the global problems. And uh, thirdly, I put a hill slope here from the ridge to the valley and the planet here, two very different scales on the same page because I hope to make a point uh, at the end of the talk that hill slope hydrology is the basic alphabet of global hydrology. Uh, this is where it starts, this is the building block. Okay, so um, a little bit of background on why global views, why these three depths. And uh, I was trained as a hydrologist uh, 
and uh, at these scales, vertical columns, hill slopes, and the small catchments, as most hydrologists uh, are trained. And uh, we have a lot of ideas how water flows on the landscape. And, uh, but it's not what described in these global models, large river basins, continental scales, and the planetary scales. There is a big disconnect. And uh, I noticed this disconnect uh, when I came back from uh, extended uh, leave and I really wanted to do something new, something of my own uh, initiative. And so I started reading, and naturally, uh, global change, global environmental change um, in the, the present, uh, in the past, in the future, floated to the top as the most pressing issues we face today. And uh, there's little question that uh, we humans, through many actions, are conducting a planetary scale experiment with Earth. Uh, this is temperature warming. And uh, going uh, along with our global problem, we are also capable of making global scale observations. And this is uh, the MODIS Satellite Vegetation Index. We can monitor the productivity of the whole planet at 250 meter. Uh, spatial scales and the four-day temporal scales. And pertaining to water, and we have this GRACE satellites that uh, monitors the loading and unloading of water on the continent. And tying all these together uh, is the so-called Earth system models that attempt to capture the first-order interactions between uh, the lithosphere, the cryosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and the biosphere. And these models are becoming increasingly capable and powerful. And as shown here is a, an NCAR climate model simulation uh, of the uh, vapor transport in the atmosphere. You see water vapor rising from the land surface and from the ocean and uh, moves north and south the poleward transport and rains out in those orange blobs. And in the ocean, we also have incredible capabilities to, uh, it's not coming up, of simulating uh, the ocean currents to astonishing degrees. And we can see this, this conveyor belt in motion. And I find these awe inspiring, despite the problems we have with our global models, just to think that we using a few uh, first principles and with some empirical relations, and we can set the atmosphere and the ocean into such magnific magnificent motion, and they actually look very real. Just to think that by a being able to do this, we actually have a crystal ball, however fuzzy it is. Uh, we can look into the future and to see the trajectory of the future planet. But as a hydrologist, my eyes are on the continent. And I want to know how water moves on land in these models. And we hydrologists have lots of ideas. We know water convergence from hills to rivers. We know there's the groundwater moving across aquifers and going into the rivers. But how are they described in these models? So I put this question to uh, my then office mate, a postdoc, Gonzalo Miguez Macho. He has been my close collaborator. He's a climate modeler. And I said, how does water flow on land? And he said, oh, that's simple. We have those two to three meter thick land slabs, you know, usually a few degree by few degree uh, dimension. And when rain falls on it, some water gets caught in the capillary uh, surface tension, and, but much leaks through. And now we put that in the ocean and route that into the, we put that into the river and route that into the ocean according to those large-scale river flow directions. And I said, where's the groundwater? And he said, what groundwater? And I find this surprising, right? Um, for hydrologists, we, if we don't integrate groundwater surface water as a continuum, we can't make sense of anything we observe. And how do these climate modelers interpret or make sense of their model results? By missing the groundwater, the land drains freely. And there's very little memory. When the rain comes, the land is wet. When the rain goes, the land is dry. 
And the plants are rain-fed only. So if you don't rain for months, plants are dead. Uh, so this is really a surprise to me. So this question is, why do such sophisticated models, now in, uh, including carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphor cycle, uh, in, in, including soil microbial processes, and including dynamic vegetation, such sophisticated model have such primitive water cycle, arguably the most basic of the energy and material cycles on Earth. And indeed, there are very good reasons why so. And today's Earth system models uh, came from the general circulation models which in turn came from numerical weather prediction models, which by design are short-ranged. They don't care about memory, just a few days forecast. And atmospheric-centric, they care about weather, not land. And the land and ocean were added later to improve atmospheric predictions. There are boundary conditions to the atmosphere. And so, and the land hydrology um, model in these climate models were written by climate scientists. And they're conceptualized by them and coded by them. So that is hydrologists have not been the chief architects of the hydrology model in these global models. That's one reason. Second reason is the computation limitations. When you have global models, the process has to be simple. The grid has to be large. It just doesn't really jive with what we hydrologists do. We are obsessed with complexity. And so, but these are not really good reasons, right? These are really excuses. Maybe there's a really good reason. That is, groundwater uh, is just not important at the very large scales. And uh, my little watershed has shallow water table in the valleys. That might be just an exception. Okay, so because, you know, uh, when you look at global scales, uh, the climatic water balance has been very successful in guiding our understanding of the biome distribution. So from the satellite looking at Earth, um, you know, the little noises probably just don't matter. And so then my question is, is groundwater important at large scales? That prompted me to um, ask my first question. And of course, then the first order question is, how deep is the water table globally? If the water table is indeed very deep, tens of meters below the land surface, then the surface is free drained. And then these models are fine, and all my problems will go away, and I'll, I'll shut up. And so that's my question. Where, how deep is the water table? Where is the water table? So I set out uh, to look for data. Um, here is uh, where my first question came from. It's really to understand, is groundwater shallow enough over a large enough area of the Earth? And so I started compiling data because there's no global maps. People have been reporting site water table, but no global. So I spent many years uh, digging through the literature, um, going through government archives, begging, threatening, bribing, anything I can do to get their data. Uh, so and after many years, I got this 1.6 million data. And uh, plotted here, you see there's a lot of white space. We just don't have a lot of data. And a lot of data are not reported, especially in developing countries. So I'm going to zoom in to the best observed continent, which is North America. And uh, the Canadians are to be congratulated. They have the best national database. And in 2006, when I started contacting them, they didn't put together. They said, oh, we're doing that. Uh, in a couple of years, come back, check with us. So I checked back every year. Of course, they didn't put it together. In 2012, I submitted this paper. I said, I'm going to just check one more time. I went there. Boom, everything's online. So I downloaded data, withdrew my paper from science, and then rewrote the paper, put in the data, and then submitted it again. And so uh, I'm very thankful to the Canadian government, and uh, as many of you uh, are in this room. And so what do we see from this map? It's very noisy, but one big signal is the groundwater pumping. These are the groundwater depletion areas. But I'm looking for the natural signal. So what I can say from this very noisy data, two very simple things. Number one, shallow groundwater is pretty common. It's not like a rare thing. One dot here, one dot here. Blue is shallow. And the pattern really follows terrain more than the climate. You have shallow water table in the arid basins, in the lowlands, and you have water table in the humid places, and in mountainous regions and in flat places. 
And so climate doesn't really give us very good guidance in inferring groundwater, and topography instead stands out. You can see the valley and the ridge difference. And uh, I want to test this hypothesis. The data is very sparse, and I want to say, I want to see if I build a global model, as simple as possible, do these features bear out? And so we build a very simple model. The continents are columns. The groundwater will flow laterally. Just relaxation by Darcy's law and using sea level as boundary condition. And uh, Darcy's law and the mass balance, that, that's all there is. But we don't have continental global scale uh, conductivity. So we use some very, very simple assumption, which is exponential decay, which is what geologists have been seeing. But we wanted the decay to be slow in the valley because the sediments accumulate here and uh, permeability decreases slowly. And in the mountain, the steep slopes, and it decreases quickly because you, you hit the bedrock quickly. So it's just really a first order common sense uh, model that as simple as we can get it and run it on the computer, and again, Gonzalo who coded it, and uh, here is the result. And uh, of course, this is all wrong, right? We don't have the real geology in there, uh, but that's not the point. The point is my question, are there large fractions of the Earth's surface? Where water table is very shallow, the land is not freely drained. And the water table can actually influence atmospheric processes by influencing evapotranspiration. So what we can see is the large patches of shallow water table uh, can be seen at, at, from the satellite at the global map. And even zooming into the, so, um, you know, the deep water table regions, you can see in the valleys they're shallow. And I did my dissertation here, and I did a lot of camping and drilling and monitoring the groundwater, and our truck gets stuck in the soft mud all the time, and we know water table is right at the surface, it's saturated valley floor, so I know at least that point is right. And I must show also this area uh, of, I think, uh, Saskatoon is somewhere here, and, uh, and even in the shallower place you have high, um, deep water table and a shallow water table, and then you have all these potholes and a lot of wetlands in this area. So there are also many small patches of shallow water table uh, when you zoom in, in the valleys. And uh, if you put all this together, it's, a, it's like a significant fraction of the land surface water table is two meter to five meter deep. Uh, the numbers are not very meaningful. The idea is that this is a fraction that cannot be uh, ignored. And so to convince the climate modelers that this is important, it has to matter to evapotranspiration, to carbon cycle, et cetera, to influence the atmosphere. And then the question is, can plants reach groundwater? Is the groundwater shallow enough for the plants? But then that also depends on how deep the roots are. If the roots are deep, then shallow groundwater, it's not necessary. Deep water table will be uh, important. So that led me to asking the second question of my talk, how deep do roots go, which is really the other side of the same question. They have to meet in the middle. Okay, so I started my second question, that's how deep do roots go? And uh, plant roots are really, really difficult to observe. And when we dig out the roots, we basically kill the, the tree, and we cannot see the dynamics. And it's very labor intensive. And yet roots are so important in itself. And deep roots will give plants more resilience to fire, to drought. Uh, deep roots will slow down erosion and enhance weathering. And the deep roots will enhance life in the soil because they're the base of the soil food chain, food web. But we don't know very much about it because it's so difficult to observe. And that's a very bad combination, right? It's, it's something's important and we don't know very much. And so I started looking for data again, and the place to start is the synthesis put together in the, in the 90s by uh, Rob Jackson's group. These are plant rooting depths around the vertical. On the horizontal is the biome, so they organize the rooting depth uh, by the biomes. And uh, you in tundra, you have shallow roots. Agriculture, you have shallow roots. This all makes sense. In tundra, there's a frozen soil below. And then in agriculture, the, the plants start from seeds each year. Doesn't really have time or no need to go deeper. But what really stands out is this huge range in the arid and semi-arid and the seasonal climates. You have here in the 
tropical grassland savanna seasonal, you have a one meter to 68 meter. That's a huge range. So what explains this huge range within the same climate system, within the same biome, uh, age, species, of course, but this is a huge range. And uh, plants, roots, see the local soil moisture. So my hypothesis is that the bumps and the wrinkles on land that reorganize the hydrology, so you have wet patches and dry patches, must be some of the sub-climate scale variability that causes root to change. If you think this through, along a topographic gradient, and the water table is differentiated, deep here and shallow here. And uh, you, if you have rain infiltrating from the top, and then groundwater capillarized from the bottom, you have two ways of wetting that soil profile. And if you are a plant uh, on the high ground, and the water table is too deep, you don't know where, you don't know it exists. And so you utilize the rain that penetrated the soil. You use, utilize the, the soil profile that's wetted by rain. And uh, there are so many examples of those. I'm showing you one in the Negev Desert in Israel. And the roots, here's a woody shrub. The roots are 10 centimeter deep, but two meters wide because they don't sense the groundwater. They capture, they spread out to capture that rare and precious rain and capture as much as they can. But the further down gradient, somewhere for the down gradient, uh, these two wetting zones might be very close to each other. And if you have occasional deep infiltration events, and that can lead roots to the deep wetting zone. And here's an example of the root systems of a eucalyptus tree in Western Australia. You have a shallow cluster that uses rain in the wet season, and a deep cluster right above the water table, 15 meter deep, using the groundwater in the dry season. This is a place that you have very strong dry season. This is a Mediterranean climate. In the middle, just the pipes transporting the water. And uh, further down, you will have no water limitation on the two wetting zones. And something else has to be determining the rooting depth. And further down, you're going to have a seasonal water logging. And the roots don't like to go below the water table. There's no oxygen. They can't breathe. And so shallow roots are very commonly observed. You hike, this is in Oregon. Uh, this is in the Amazon lowlands. You have 30 to 50 meter tall trees with roots only 10 centimeter deep and they have those buttresses and stilts to provide the structural support. And further down, when you go down to the permanent water logging, and you have plants that are adapted to the special conditions, they don't care, they are decoupled with the groundwater again. And so the idea is that if the hill slopes differentiate the rooting depth, shallow, deep, and shallow again, and will this contribute to the large variability within a single climate? And we have a lot of monos, uh, culture studies, forests, and the crops that show this huge variation for the single species along the groundwater gradient. And so to test this hypothesis, I want to collect the water, uh, rooting depth as much as I can. So I spent five years digging through um, literature to find rooting uh, reports as much as I can get. So I have this gigantic Excel sheet recording vegetation and the maximum rooting depth, not just the climate, but also topography and the drainage conditions and the soil, uh, basically the hydrologic conditions. And so uh, five years later, I have 2,000 data points and covering greater than 1,000 species. And so here is what looks on the global map, not very much. And if you look at the distribution, it's really skewed. And one meter, two meter is the peak. Is this real? Um, it seems to be a convenient stop, convenient place to stop for the root excavations. All trenches go to one meter or two meters, it's just for convenience. Many of them don't really follow all the way. And then you have those very deep 70 meters and 52 meters. These were accidentally discovered. So I think deep roots probably undersampled. We're not looking for roots, we're looking draining groundwater wells, etc. We found those plump, juicy, live roots. So to test my hypothesis that hill slope hydrology drives rooting depth, I plotted all my data against the precipitation, and the vertical is the rooting depth. And this is in the log scale. At any rainfall, you have three to two orders magnitude rooting depth difference. Here's the soil texture, very fine to very coarse. 
at any soil texture, you have a wide range. Here is the depth of the barriers, either bedrock surface and or soil hard pans. And half of the samples penetrated the soil, the roots, uh, the bedrock, and into the fractures. There are a lot of fractures in the, in the broken rocks in the saprolites. And then these two plots are plants. And here's by growth form or um, the uh, plant functional type. And then again, you know, there's pattern. I rank them small or herbaceous plants have shallower roots and the large woody trees, especially evergreen trees have deeper roots. There's a pattern. But again, there's a huge uh, range of variability. And by, um, by the species, this is a gen genera, 30 most observed genera. And uh, they, again, it's a very, very good pattern. But again, there's a huge degree of phenotypic plasticity within each uh, genus. And when I plot them against the, the water table, uh, the relationship is, is uh, quite, quite uh, significant. And the points above are the roots above the water table. The points are the roots below the water table. So, but they are clustering around the water table. So why? Um, because this is what we call the groundwater push and the pull. So this is the push. If you're in the valley, groundwater is very shallow, pushes roots shallow, shallower to avoid the anoxia. And here, if you are deep, but not too deep, within the reach, and its roots are pulled deeper. And this push and pull um, make the data points tighter. And this push and pull is best illustrated in this little book called uh, Tree Roots of, in Eastern Nebraska. Um, this, those were 46 trees of 37 species excavated um, in the 30s to study why some trees lived, why others didn't. Uh, they are planted there as uh, windbreakers. And so this was to create jobs for the, in the Great Depression when people had no work to do. And the data were collected and the painstakingly pages of drawings put in a box and lost until in the 70s somebody discovered a box of papers and stapled them together and made it into a little book. I don't even remember, remember how I found it, but I emailed them and they sent me a copy. So uh, I have this little copy. It's not even officially published. But pages and pages of drawings. You have the same species. Here's plain cottonwood. Same species, but different water table. 14 feet deep and 2.5 feet deep. Roots went to the water table. And here is Siberian elm uh, water table, 16 feet and 6.5 feet. Again, water table is where the root ended. And so when you put all these data together, the data went into three clusters. This is deep water table and then deep roots. So you have this cluster that's sitting on the hilltop that just doesn't know there's a groundwater, so they're completely decoupled. There's a wider range. It doesn't matter where the water table is. And here's a cluster that are pulled closer to the water table. And here's a cluster that are pushed shallower by the water table. And uh, this is a small geographic area, and the rainfall is the same, and the soil texture is all uh, sooty loam, and the groundwater varied hugely and from zero to 25 meters. And this is, that really brought out the, the groundwater influence. And so emerging from all these observations is a new conceptual framework to understand root behavior. So on the vertical is the climate that people have always been invoking. On the right, now on the horizontal is topography. We add another dimension to it now. So you have arid climate with pulses of rain and you have seasonal climate that gets a lot of rain but concentrated in the wet season. And you have this place that rains constantly. And if you are on the high ground, this is the ridge top and the valley bottom. If you're on the high ground in the arid climate, you only see the shallow infiltrated soil uh, wetness. And, and that's the only thing you know. So your roots are like that. But somewhere further down on the, on the terrace, for example, the water table can be sensed uh, by some deep infiltration events. And then you grow those dimorphic roots that are widely reported. And then if you are in the uh, wetter, seasonally wet climate, their soil is wetted to a deeper depth. So the roots would use all that water possible. And again, downstream somewhere you can use in the dry season, use the groundwater. 
And in the always humid climate, it rains constantly. There's no point for roots to invest in deep water. They are smart. Roots are really smart. And we treat roots in our models, one meter for old herbaceous plants and two meter for old woody plants. And if I were a plant, I would be so insulted. <laughs> and so this, this may explain, help at least contribute toward a large range of variability in the arid and the semi-arid and seasonal climate. And you have this polarizing root behavior, very shallow, very deep, very shallow, very deep. But because they reflect the polarizing soil hydrology with versus without groundwater. And so this is all good and well. And, uh, but the majority of the land surface is really on the high ground. Groundwater is not really accessible. I'm the first to admit uh, I've been arguing for the importance of groundwater, but I know much, much of the highland uh, earth does not sense the groundwater. So that led me to the question, how deep does rain penetrate? They are governed by the rain penetration depth. So I wanted to now focus my third question on rain penetration depth to explain the global patterns of rooting depth. So that is, water table led me to rooting depth. Rooting depth now led me to uh, the rain infiltration depth. And so there's the third um, depth that I want to cover. Okay, so I'm just beginning to do this and I hope to compile data again. Uh, there are some observations of soil moisture, chloride, and isotope profiles. I want to create this global dot map. That's where always where I start. Make a dot map and then connect the dots and get some idea of what is the big patterns. And, but before I do that, it's going to be many years and I don't want to wait for that long before I do the next thing. Uh, we have some intuitions, right? If you have very high intensity and short duration rain, combined with a very fine texture soil, you're going to have shallow infiltration. On the other extreme, if you have low intensity, those slow drizzling rain, steady and the slow rain, and the coarse soil texture, you're going to have deep infiltration. So these are some of the intuitives. So my question is, can we say something about this without waiting for another five years to get the data. And uh, understanding the, the depth of the rain penetration has a lot of, a lot of implication. One of the implications I think is relevant here is they may help in uh, explaining the, the, the two water worlds. Uh, a, a really exciting discussion and concept spearheaded by uh, some of my colleagues sitting in this classroom. And so the idea is that if you look at isotopic compos uh, composition of deuterium and O18, uh, here's groundwater, here's a river water, here's a plant, and here is the soil water. And the plant water is different from river and the groundwater, but it's closer to the soil water in the Vedo zone that are fractionated by soil evaporation. And the result is that you're going to have plants that have very using soil water. And the rivers and groundwater is a different source that comes through and go to the rivers bypassing the soil matrix. And one way this can happen is that you have all these preferential flow paths. And this is very, very, very um, widespread. We know we have fractures, we know we have wormholes, we know we have root uh, holes that can provide a highway for rain to go down and bypassing the soil matrix and it goes into the river. So you have the blue water that often not related to the green water that is plant use. But another mechanism, another way this can happen is that most of the infiltration events are shallow. They just don't go to the groundwater. And uh, you, if you look at uh, infiltration, uh, some soil moisture data. The majority of the rain events are very shallowly penetrating. They go just a little bit of rain and stop. They didn't go very far. And very few, fewer and fewer and fewer events have actually the long enough duration, just the right timing, the soil's already wetted and can reach the water table. So then this would also explain, because only during the recharge season when you have a lot of uh, soil water and a lot of rain, and that can reach groundwater. Most times it doesn't reach groundwater. It really just stayed the soil and got sent back by the atmosphere. So I think this is another possible mechanism to explain the two water worlds, and I really want to explore this with, with Jeff. And uh, where, where is um, where's my friend? Uh, yes, yes. 
have you made? Yes. And so we have a lot to talk about. I really want to pick your brain on this. And, uh, and so, um, so it's good to know, get ahead, but before I collect the data, I want to see what is the global pattern of the rain penetration depth. And so what might they look like? It's just not a curiosity-driven question. I just can't wait to see. And so I'm going to see what can model tell us, a very simple model. We have some simple soil physics here. We have soil texture data. We can probably, without waiting for the observations, and then do a model, and then we can test. Is the model actually capture what observations tell us? And so this model is very simple. We have the rain, right? Rain comes and goes with the climate. We have global soil maps. So we can let the rain infiltrate into the soil, uh, depending on the rain frequency intensity, you know, we have a pretty hourly data globally, we can simulate that. And if it ever, if it ever reaches uh, the groundwater, then the topography will guide it into the valleys, etc. So basically, by doing so, we can create a uh, infiltration depth and water table depth in hourly time step. You can see these two pulses go up and down, up and down. And so uh, the model is very simple. I'm not going to spend too much time. It's just basic um, Darcy's law, Richards equation solving vertical flow, and then groundwater, surface water exchange, by again using Darcy's law, again using Darcy's law, just really simple model, what I call this uh, a common sense hydrology model. Okay, so what this gives us is this uh, monthly, and I cannot show daily, too big a file, monthly rainfall infiltration depth. And this is a monthly water table depth. And you can see these pulse coming and going, coming and going. Most of the time, they don't really reach the groundwater. I can only show the Amazon, the global is too big. OK, so this sets the stage for roots, right? You have the top wetting, you have the bottom wetting, you have the soil moisture profile. Now the roots come in. Let's see what I want to do. OK, so we can back out what roots want to do and by having the roots make some smart decisions. And at first, we need to know how much water is needed by the plant. And we can observe by satellite the leaf area index. And that tells us how much water they need to transpire. And then the atmospheric wind, humidity, temperature tell us how thirsty the atmosphere is. By combining these two, we can back calculate the demand of water. If this much water is demanded, and then we can decide how deep the roots have to go to get enough water to meet that demand. And so uh, we use a simple Ohm's law, like you have parallel connected soil layers uh, in the Ohm's circulation, uh, circuit. And every layer contributes by the wetter layer, shallower layer, least resistance layer will provide more. Okay, so very, very simple decision rule. By doing that, now we can have a root decision on what route would it take. And the rooting depth didn't vary too much. So I have to plot, this is the what, water uh, taken from the top one meter as a fraction of the total water uptake. It gives you a shifting. When it's dark brown, it tells you 100% of the transpiration comes from the top meter. And then the white shows you 0% comes from the top meter. It gives you a sense of the shifting of the uh, water uptake from the plants. And so uh, there are a lot of features on the co-evolution of the three, and I won't have time to talk about. Uh, I have to move on. And if you zoom into the rooting depth, this is uptake depth over the South America continent. If you go to one point, and you can see the time sequence on the horizontal is years. And so you can see uh, the infiltration. And here, the blue line shows you the infiltration depth. So the majority of the year, it does not reach the water table. Only like two months, it reached the water table. And that water table, boom, rises in response to that. And so this tells you that much of the infiltration didn't reach the water table and got pulled back up into the atmosphere. Uh, this could be a mechanism explaining the separation of green and blue water. And here's the water table rise. And here is the plant um, water uptake from different layers. And so it gives you a window on the possible dynamics and interactions. And again, this is just a model. I fully uh, understand that. And then another point I want to show is the uh, Western Australia, that dimorphic root of eucalyptus. And uh, the model shows something like this. The rain is very shallow, never penetrated very deep. 
The groundwater here is recharged in the upland. You know, there's a big scarp on Western Australia that recharges the groundwater. So groundwater came, and then the roots sense that. So you have the dimorphic roots in the dry season. A deep cluster of uptake kicks in to meet the demand. And uh, so here is the promised three hydrologic depth of a global view. And uh, there's a whole lot of information here. I won't have time to explain. But this can really uh, be useful in understanding many global processes. And uh, this is the infiltration depth. This is a 10-year model simulation mean from uh, zero to 40 meter. And uh, this depth combined with the groundwater table depth can, and combined with the rooting depth can tell us a whole lot. For example, nutrient cycle. How deep does the nutrient get leached by rain washed out of the soil? versus how deep the plant roots go and bring that back up again. So we can't close the nitrogen cycle because we really don't know how much the nitrogen is lost from deep rain infiltration. And maybe it has something to do with the separation of the two waters. How often does the infiltration reach the water table? Uh, that will help us to shed some light on that question. And soil carbon pool, how much carbon is stored in our soil? That has a lot to do with rooting depth. We can, the variations is huge on different estimates, how much carbon is in the soil and how quickly they turn over. And uh, how deep is the soil? Soil is really defined by biological activities. When roots go down to previously uh, sterile sediments, it brings in composers and, and decomposers, consumers, it really starts the whole ecosystem. So defining soil depth is really a question defining rooting depth. And the plant biogeography, and this is the hydrologic environment, where would the plant choose to live? Can they survive? And wetlands, we have a lot of problems in the city of simulating wetlands in those global models because we don't have drainage problems. All these processes are hugely important on Earth system evolution. And they are fundamentally regulated by hydrological processes. Those are the core processes. And these hydrologic processes are not climate determined. They are climate plus terrain plus life. They work together to, to define the hydrology. So uh, the water cycle I wanted to uh, say is that hydrology uh, this gun got, got mixed. The water cycle is really the most basic cycle. Once we know the water cycle, we can constrain many of the processes deeply relevant, uh, cared by the Earth system modelers. Okay, lastly, I want to talk about one feedback, when the three surfaces co-evolve. And so when we have a water table now determined by the smart roots, this is the most recent model and paper we came out with smart roots, that roots respond to infiltration depth from the top and the groundwater depth from the bottom. And this is the resulting mean water table. And in 2013, we had a paper out without smart roots. Roots were dumb, one meter for herbaceous, two meter for wood. And so we have a water table like this. And when we actually have smart roots, we have much, much deeper groundwater table, of course, because they are now allowed to go down there to find their resources. Plants are not put there to die. They, are put, they, they survive because they know how to. And so there's a big difference. And so here's a feedback. When you have accessible groundwater at the bottom of the hill, for example, that pulls the roots deeper. And then that can induce deeper infiltration and a deeper water table directly and indirectly by enhancing weathering, deep roots, weather rocks. And then that can increase the depth of the sediment. And then more water can infiltrate. And then if you have a deeper water table, deeper infiltration, that you, you will induce deeper roots. So they have this feedback. Through this feedback, we can have a much, much deeper critical zone. And so the question is, does deeper roots equal to deeper critical zone? And uh, this has implications to the evolution of the plant and the continent. 400 million years ago, in the early Devonian, the land is pretty much barren. Only primitive plants lived in the wetland. And uh, by the end of the Devonian, and uh, above ground, you have those little cooksonia had become acupateras. Those are evergreen. Those are uh, conifers and basically uh, gymnosperms and uh, progymnosperms. They are big trees. 
And below ground, you have very simple single cellular rhizoids. Now you have extensive root systems. What drove the deep roots? And uh, this is a key question in understanding how the critical zone evolved. And so if you draw a cross section from the ridge, barren ridge top to the valley, and this is what you will see and the bedrock and a little bit of sediment in the valleys. And if you are a happy little horse, um, horsetail plant, wetland plant. One moment is you're in water, you're very happy. Next moment you are high and dry because water level fluctuated back then just like it fluctuated now. And so what do you do? Okay, so the characteristic feature of wetlands is the shallow water table. And you have water stress, but you also have an easy solution. And that's a perfect combination for innovation. So if you happen to dip your feet deeper to tap the deep water and you get deep roots, you can survive the dry season. And then you will be bigger next year. And then you would want more water. And then you would dig your roots even deeper. And by doing so, uh, they can increase the soil depth. And so I have been collecting root fossils. And I have now uh, tens of data points of fossil roots, and then they have the same kind of sensitivity to water table just as today. And then they go down to reach the water table and then bend sideways to avoid water table. And they did that back then. And so if this bears out after I finish my data collection, then there's the hypothesis that the groundwater root interaction and the feedback may have initiated a wave of weathering that moved the plants upward, moved the sediments upward. Deep roots will hold soil, prevent erosion. Deep roots will weather, and then will release more nutrients. And then they're bigger plants, and then they're hungrier and thirstier. They need more, and they get big deeper. OK, so I'm working with my colleague, uh, a paleontologist in Stanford, to really test this hypothesis. Uh, because after all, if you look, this is the time evolution, right? Which is very similar to the spatial sequence. When you look at the hill uh, slope scale, the early plants live in the valleys. The modern plants live in the hills. So you have a strict correspondence of time and space in here. OK, so a lot to be tested, a lot of uh, work to do. To summarize, um, global Earth system models do not have groundwater. And that prompted me to ask, how deep is the water table? And uh, they could be in the root zone, we found. And then that, that's the second question, how deep are roots? And then through that analysis, we realized that rooting depth depends on groundwater table depth and also depends on rain infiltration depth. And that prompted us to ask, how deep does rain penetrate? So through this process, what we learned is that all three surfaces have a fundamental structure. That is the topography. And if you look at those global maps, there's the zoom-ins uh, in this area. You see the river valleys and the high grounds and low grounds are very different. The high grounds and low grounds are very different. The difference between high and low grounds in the vicinity is greater than across the climate zones. And uh, secondly, uh, global hydrology and the biogeochemistry is really anchored in hill slope hydrology and geochemistry. And this is the basic alphabet of global hydrology. Hill, hill slope hydrology is the basic alphabet. Arrange them in a meaningful way, you get uh, watersheds. And that's all, those are the words. And uh, arrange those words meaningfully, you get large river basins. And that are our sentences. And arrange them meaningfully, you get a continent. And that's our uh, chapter. And so in this way, um, our global hydrology really starts with uh, hill slope hydrology. And everything you do at hill slope scale is completely relevant. And thirdly, um, we have, as hydrologists, we have an obligation to zoom out, really. Stand. Uh, your little watershed is interesting, extremely interesting. But it's more interesting when it's put side by side with another watershed. And so we have the obligation to zoom out. We can't complain. Those models are no good. We need to actually help uh, rewriting the ESMs. We need to engage. OK, so that's uh, all I have. And uh, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I duplicated one page. And I want to thank my colleague, uh, Gonzalo uh, Miguel Macho. He's a physics professor now back at home in Spain. You don't get to be a physics professor if you're not super smart. Uh, he is, uh, has such great intuition, he can make a concept into a code and makes the code work and the results make total sense. And I'm greatly indebted to him. 
and uh, I would have funding support and computation support. Everything has to be done on a supercomputer in parallel processing, and those are not easy obstacles, but Gonzalo could overcome it. And I thank him, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thanks, Ying. That was really an extraordinary talk. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, over here, first question. So um, how would you see the, the groundwater model that's coupled within regional or global ESM or climate model? Because they're really working on different scales and yeah. different resolutions. So, yeah. um, so for example, like the global model is in the resolution of a degree, but the groundwater model is in the resolutions of one kilometers. That's a huge gap. Actually much smaller than that. Right. Slopes it can be 10 meter, you know, 20 meter, 100 meter. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. Uh, that's why, you know, I have some ideas how to do it, and but I, that's just my idea. And but I wanted to do is to organize the community. And so we have this project. It's a uh, collaboration with NCAR, the CLM uh, Land Model Working Group, to uh, motivate the community and the hy what hydrologists think. Uh, what is the most essential processes? that need to be representing those models, and how do we do it efficiently? So there's a lot of ideas. There's a synthesis project going on right now to uh, really pull out the, the collective wisdom of all hydrologists, not just myself. Uh, can we agree on what is the most obvious low-hanging fruits that we can harvest uh, from the hill slope hydrology community and to implement that into global hydrology? And so we can, one example is we can divide a one degree by one degree grid cell into different drainage zones, uh, high and mid and low slopes. And then just model those three categories of zonage relationship. That is just one example. But there are ways getting around it to not to increase too much of the computation. Okay. Um, so this is an ongoing project and hopefully next year we'll have a paper recommending what is the best way to do it. Um, okay, sorry, but uh, I probably have another question that's also related to the uh, global, gl the groundwater feedback to the atmosphere. Is like, so uh, thanks to the talk, you talked about the uh, the feedback to the zoo, uh, the depth of the Routing zoots. Depth. Yes, mm -hmm. how would you see the effect of the groundwater representation in the that feedback to the atmosphere f through evapotranspiration, near surface temperature, PBL depth, right. or right. and is this effect that's related to uh, your resolution of the model? Like yeah, sure, sure, definitely uh, related to, to what degree we can capture uh, the, the structure, land surface structure. That is definitely a, a function of the uh, grid resolution that we can handle. Uh, but how does it impact atmosphere? There are uh, quite a few papers now talking about that. And uh, in, in, in many places, it's not that strong. In some places, it is. It's not the mean flux of ET over large grid, uh, you know, coming from groundwater. It, what it changed, what it changed is really the timing, you know. And when you don't have groundwater, you don't have memory. And so you don't have ET uh, in the dry season. But if you have groundwater, you have convergence, you have patches of landscape that has ET. Uh, so you reorganize the space and the time. How does that exactly change the quantity of ET? It may not be that much, but it changed the structure of ET in space and time. And that is hugely relevant to not just the ET, but to carbon cycle, to uh, you know, uh, biogeochemical cycle, nutrient cycle. You have plants alive, otherwise will be dead without groundwater. And so it's not just ET, you know, ET is a direct uh, physical impact on the climate uh, through the energy cycle, through what you said, influencing the boundary layer uh, dynamics and thermodynamics. Uh, but that's not the only path. Good. Other questions? What about uh, the age of the water? Um, there was a paper earlier this year led by Scott Giseco showing that below maybe 200 meters or so, 
most groundwater is uh, fossil water, pre-Holocene in age. And I guess uh, that, that's not that deep in the scheme of things. It's not. It's not maybe yeah. plant accessible water necessarily, but uh, right. how, how do we take account of that groundwater that's uh, clearly below the rooting depth, but is a maybe an important store for the global water right. cycle that's slowly moving and by definition is uh, right. yeah, old and, and, and slow moving. Yeah, that's the memory. This grant relates to some of Grant's work as well. I'm eager to get his thoughts. Oh, hi. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, that, that's really, um, really a difficult problem to, to bring into the, you know, in the Earth system modeling perspective. And Earth system models right now, they're not, um, you know, designed to address very, very long time scales. Mm -hmm. Uh, Holocene groundwater is important to humans, to our groundwater exploitation and the groundwater sustainability problems, but it's not really the central focus yet. Uh, so that's one point I want to make. And, uh, you know, what I'm talking about is really the shallow, very active, uh, the seasonal turnover kind yeah. of cycle that influences current atmospheric uh, interactions with land. Uh, but the deep water is really, really important. And I really believe that uh, these models, sooner or later, will be used to study evolution of the uh, groundwater and yeah. water cycle in a longer time scale. And then we need to bring that in. Right. Yeah. Right. Questions? Yeah. Uh, very impressive study and uh, intensive data collection, of course, uh, very impressive. Uh, I wonder, uh, during your data collection, was there any difference between some of these depths that you have observed between agricultural areas where yes. human impacts are seen, or did you only observe, like, study the natural areas, or could they have some impacts on some of the like your results? My data, probably. sure, sure. Uh, regarding groundwater, I try to filter out uh, the pumping influence because USGS, for example, has a flag on the data is pumping influence. I try to filter that out because I am uh, after the natural signal. And with the rooting depth, yes, there are you know, agri agriculture um, uh, crops, and uh, if it's not irrigated, I'll take it. But it's irrigated, I don't take it. Uh, so I try to to filter them out, uh, and uh, but area wise, like do we see a lot of agriculture over the world or yes, yes, I try to minimize the agriculture uh, data, you know, on rooting depth uh, in my collections because you know they're fertilized often. Uh, so I try to you know, any any of those uh, the, if, if the article mentioned that, and I I didn't include them. Yeah, just to focus on the natural signal. Okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. Over here. Hi, thank you very much. It's so interesting for me. Thank you. You bring all the questions. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think about the root distribution in the depths? Yes. yes. Um, actually, our researcher told that root biomass and density decrease by increasing the depths. Mm -hmm. So. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about the nitrogen effects of nitrogen deficiency on water stress? I mean, um, do you think that nitrogen deficiency increase the uh, plant resistance to water stress or not? Yeah, let me see uh, the, 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 the first question. You know, uh, rooting depth is really the simplest uh, sort of a plant functional trait. And uh, if I get to pick the simplest one, and what would I pick? And when you talk about root architecture and uh, cores and fine root distribution and all that, you get into much, much more uh, complexity. And I think I'm not ready to address that yet. And the uh, rooting depth is really the first order uh, variable, simplest variable, and I can get a handle on. Uh, so I cannot answer your question. You know, uh, there are complicated models as well. Uh, you know, single plant, uh, how plant invest to build this kind of structure. But if I get to pick one, I'll pick the simplest. That's m really my, my philosophy uh, so far. To answer your question, the nitrogen limitation. Uh, sure, you know, there's also CO2 limitation. There's phosphate limitation, right? There's just all these uh, co-limitations. Uh, so I am focusing on water because, you know, if you look at the Kelvin cycle, uh, the first reaction, you know, the, uh, the light reaction is to 
not the first reaction. The first step of the Kelvin, the first step of the photosynthesis is really break down the water. You need water first. You need water to break down to produce oxygen and hydrogen. And then you go to the second step to, do, to go to the Kelvin cycle. And then nitrogen comes in, uh, carbon comes in, et cetera. But the water is the first step. So uh, of course, when there's no water limitation, and then nitrogen becomes the limitation. So you, you resolve one, you just elevate the plant to another limitation. Uh, so I, I really don't know how to answer your question. I don't know a whole lot about it. But again, I'm picking the simplest question. I'm a hydrologist, also I don't speak plant biology very well. Yeah, so that's, I, I'm avoiding complex problems. <laughs> okay. One, one last question here, and then we're gonna adjourn to the bar. To explain what? Biodiversity. Biodiversity. Explain yes. 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 So yes. Yes. A very good problem. Very good question. So one of my students uh, is doing that, uh, working with some ecologists in in Britain, and uh, in the Kew uh, Garden. So in the Amazon, for example, and I don't have time to show along the hill slope in Manaus area, it's in Duke Reserve. And if you look at the vegetation species distribution, it's very much correlated with the hill slope position. The quickest turnover in the, in the, the, the beta function, a beta diversity, you know, uh, turning over from one spot to another is the highest uh, at the foothills. And the, 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 uh, the least turnover is the top. So you have um, species distribution, species turnover, uh, species structure and stature. Uh, you know, they're all very much related to the water. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of study. Uh, and I cited some in the paper that I, we sent to the grad student to read. But there's a lot of research going on. It's just really taking off right now. Yeah. Good. Well, we're uh, 25 minutes to the hour, so I think we'll end here. I want to thank Ying for really a terrific visit today after a harrowing journey getting there. <laughs> uh, it was a terrific uh, day with the students in class, and this talk was... Uh, Simply extraordinary. So thank you very much, and uh, please join us at Boffins, where we'll be uh, continuing the discussion. Oh, thank you.